I'm so humbled uh, to virtually be able to join you in community and to be among these exceptional group of activists, advocates, and community builders that you've had a chance to hear from the past three nights, so many of whom I'm lucky to call colleagues and accomplices uh, in the pursuit of justice and partners in good. Um, I, I stalled for a moment in uh, starting to speak there because I'm so full. There have been so many words uh, this evening. And so I just want to say I associate myself with all the comments that have already been said uh, this evening. But together, we are really tackling an enormous question, a question which lies at the center of our shared experience. What does it take to break through generations of institutional oppression, systemic racism, white supremacy, to advance true justice for our communities. Now, it certainly requires an acknowledgement of the challenges that we face. Today, our communities are facing overlapping crises of public health, economic inequality, and systemic racism. We know that Black, Brown, and Indigenous people are dying at disproportionately higher rates from uh, COVID-19, or what Pastor uh, Warnock in Georgia refers to as COVID-19, making plain the barriers to health care that have endangered our lives for centuries. And of course, the only thing this virus couldn't kill is racism. Um, and we are so devastatingly reminded by the murders of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, and so many others. My heart breaks at the profound hurt being inflicted on our communities, but it also swells because I know that this moment of unprecedented hurt demands and requires of us unprecedented organizing, unprecedented mobilizing, and unprecedented hope. Earlier today, I was at a convening uh, with some colleagues uh, at local progress. And, and one of my brothers in arms there was offering that, you know, um, despair is, uh, is clear, but hope is more opaque. And so that's why this moment we find ourselves in of what does this reimagining, this re-envisioning, this reconstructing, this reconstructing, what does it really look like? Because hope is more opaque. But these are unprecedented times and we are experiencing unprecedented hurt. And that does demand of us unprecedented organizing, unprecedented mobilizing and unprecedented hope. So my heart breaks that we have to keep coming together to demand that people affirm and see our humanity. But it swells that we keep coming together. Activists, advocates, um, agitators, organizers, table shakers, disruptors, creatives. You know, so many of them, young, black, brown, men and women who have taken to the streets and the halls of power to demand justice. The community organizing organizers who are leading this movement, they are not destroyers. They are community builders who are carrying forward the best traditions of the civil rights movement. And no, this is not a second um, civil rights movement this national reckoning on racial justice, we have been in it the whole time. So this is not a second movement. We have been in it the entire time. Let us be clear, the injustice plaguing our communities is not naturally occurring. It has been created and exacerbated by generations of bigoted policies which have codified racism, exclusion, and bigotry. Now, growing up in Chicago, my mother and I lived in the residual aftershocks and aftermath of redlining and the failed war on drugs. And those are the same challenges which persist today. So this is why I say policy is my love language, because if the hate, hurt and harm afflicting our communities disproportionately has been legislated, that does mean that we can legislate healing and justice, too. We can pass policies and budgets that actually value black and brown lives. And if it feels uncomfortable or unfamiliar to some, it is because we have never done it before. Again, hope is opaque. So how do you build something when you don't really have a stabilizing uh, reference? We are our own analog in this moment. And that is as liberating as it can be paralytic. But still, we do have some notes that we can refer to, and we need to buckle up because, listen, my mother let me know early on. She did not patronize me as a child and read me, you know, fairy tales for bedtime stories. She read me the speeches of Barbara Jordan and Shirley Chisholm, and my coloring book was the Black Liberation Flag, and she made sure that I knew that as beautiful and as prideful as I should be about being Black, that I was being born into a struggle. 
and that that was a cradle to grave struggle. And it was her expectation that I would be active in that struggle. So buckle up, because if you look at what are the founders of, of um, the other founders of our democracy, who have not been given equal foothold in our history books. But if, if you look to them, the movement in the 1950s and 1960s and about the scale and scope of our activism at that time, let me just give you some numbers here. The Greensboro sit-ins were six months. The Freedom Rides were seven months. The Montgomery bus boycott was 382 days. So when Rashad says that we're in the underground railroad phase, he's right, we are just getting started. And as we fight for a culture shift in this country, and we've all been uh, echoing this, we must also fight for a power shift. In the past few months, we have witnessed important electoral wins across the country, from Jamal Bowen in New York to Cori Bush in Missouri. Again, the squad is big, y'all. Electing more leaders like Jamal and Cori is important, not only because they better reflect the communities they represent, but because they are fiercely committed to fighting for the policies that will usher in real sustainable change. It is so rare, y'all, that you are, exper you are creating history and acutely aware of it. Right now, we are writing the next chapter of the civil rights movement. This is about a paradigm shift, but we can't stop at the streets and the ballot boxes. We have to bring that same energy and determination to legislating because that was the real blueprint for the movement, organize, mobilize, legislate. And so that's the work that I've been doing in deep partnership with folks in my two years in Congress. And I won't enumerate all of that. I'll just say that it's been a wonderful to work in partnership with a coalition of lawmakers, organizations and advocates in the fight to end qualified immunity, to hold law enforcement accountable, to dismantle racist systems of policing in this country, to ensure an equitable um, recovery, both in our public health and economic response. And in the past several months, you know, as we talk about this culture shift and Rashad mentioned how people are with greater efficacy and fluency saying black lives matter. You know, but if we really value black lives, then we need to back that up with meaningful action. And that means that you are unapologetically affirming that, yes, we need to cancel uh, student debt because black students borrow and default more than anyone else uh, because of laws that obstructed our ability to build generational wealth. That is a racial justice issue. So black students matter. That black um, uh, business entrepreneurship matters. That black creatives matter. That black home ownership matters. Black artists matter, black data matters, black research matters, right? So in short, thank you for your Black Lives Matter post. Now show me your budget. The only receipts that we care about in this moment are law change and budget change. I, I was just um, revisiting how the top 100 public US companies all put out statements for Black Lives Matter and they don't have one black person serving on their board. So we have an opportunity to legislate our values, to continue pushing for policy that actually codify equity and justice for the folks in our communities. But it will take collective advocacy. It will take us being intentional. It will take our being inclusive. It will take collective organizing and collective power because as has been said, Alicia was speaking to this, we don't just organize for elections. You know, although we wanna celebrate those victories, including of my sister, my sister Ilhan, you know, folks like to think that this is a wave, anomalies, a fluke. This isn't black girl magic, this is black woman work. And my colleague has been putting that in. <laughs> so I just wanna acknowledge that. But we don't just organize for elections. We organize to build community. We organize to build power. And then we need to flex it. Now, Dr. King said change does not roll in on the wheels of inevitability, but comes through continuous struggle. I hope I'm bringing this full circle here because my mother told me I was born into. And that was her expectation that I would do my part in that struggle. And so how do we dismantle systems of oppression? How do we advance the work of equity and justice? We organize for it. We advocate for it and we legislate for it together. So grateful to be your sister in solidarity in this work. Thank you so much again for the opportunity to join you in virtual community. And um, I'll see you on the front lines. Uh -huh.